So, who likes the Beatles? They started out as a boy band, became world famous masters of their craft, did literally all of the drugs, and continued on to experiment and evolve into one of the most important and influential bands in music history. Now you're probably asking yourself, why are you talking about the Beatles during a video game review? Well, let's take a look in the big old book of video game history to find out. Ultimate Play the Game was a developer that started in 1985 and pretty much immediately started producing many well-loved games like Night Lore and Jetpack. Yeah, not winning any naming awards there, but hey, they made good stuff. The company didn't really hit their stride, however, until the Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64 eras. Now called Rareware, the developer was responsible for some of the most well-made and well-loved games of the generation, including Perfect Dark, Conker's Bad Fur Day, the Donkey Kong Country games, the Killer Instinct series, and even took on the challenge of licensed games with 007 Goldeneye. But alas, nothing good lasts forever. Rare was bought by Microsoft in 2002, and there was almost an immediate loss of quality in their products. The company went from being one of the most loved and cherished developers in the business to one of the greatest examples of why the internet loves the term sellout. They're like if the Beatles skipped the drugs and were bought by the NFL to play the Monday Night Football theme for the rest of their careers. See? It made sense after all. But hey, let's not focus entirely on the bad. Let's instead look at some of the best times of the company's history. Banjo-Kazooie is a bear and bird bonanza of a game released on June 29th, 1998. The game was received... well. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd classify that as well. Truly, if you didn't have this ultimate gem of a game, you could never hope to be one of the cool kids. Tech decks, slap bracelets, and Banjo-Kazooie, the three major ingredients of being a cool kid in the 90s. Guess who didn't have a copy of Banjo-Kazooie? Yeah, I missed out on this game as a kid. In fact, I didn't play it for the first time until pretty recently at the ripe old age of 25. And I am well past the point of being cool. It was another bright and peaceful day on Spiral Mountain. The little bear Tootie was outside playing while her brother slept off another wild crack binge from the week before. Out of nowhere, BAM! Random witch attack. She kidnaps the young Tootie with plans to steal her beauty through her beauty-stealing machine? It's closer to Seuss than Hemingway, but eh, what you gonna do? So now it's up to Big Brother Bear to save the day by collecting puzzle pieces? Just, just pretend it makes sense and we'll move on. Banjo-Kazooie is an early-era 3D platformer along the same lines as Super Mario 64 and Rayman 2. And one of my favorite things about these older 3D games are the intro levels. You see, this was a new territory for developers, and a lot of the time, they honestly just had to rely on trial and error to get things right in terms of platforming. Nothing shows this off more than the intro level. Mario 64 had bomb on Battlefield, Banjo-Kazooie has the aforementioned Spiral Mountain. And hey, we've got Bottles of the Mole! What does Bottles do? He's a dick. See? It says it right here. He's a dick. Well, if you let him teach you the basic moveset, he's considerably less of a dick. But if you're like me, you say no just to see what happens and he threatens to delete your memory card. Yeah, see? Dick move. Spiral Mountain is an almost perfect example of what an intro level should be. This kind of polish, mixed with charm, is something Rare was very, very known for. So we learn the move Smart Mouth Mole and climb the mountain to face our rhyme-tastic enemy, Gruntilda. Who, despite being convinced that she's so ugly that she has to kidnap small children to fix it, seems to have an obsession with designing parts of her lair after her own ugly mug. Not long after entering the Witch's Maw, we're faced with our first actual level in the game, Mumbo's Mountain. Now, this could also be considered an intro level in and of itself, as it is also designed around teaching you controls and mechanics. But truthfully, it's almost more of an extension of Spiral Mountain than anything. Here we learn the main points of the game. You have these puzzle pieces called Jiggies, that you're meant to collect a la stars in Mario 64. Ten per level. One of which is always achieved by finding five of these little... things... called Jinjos. In addition to the Jiggies and Jinjos, there are 100 music notes spread throughout each level. This game is part of an interesting subgenre of platformers from the time that commonly go by the term collectathon. Something else that Rare became very, very well known for. Truth be told, there's not a whole lot to talk about here. 
You walk around each level and discover where the jiggies are hidden and what tasks you have to complete to earn one. This can be anything from throwing oranges at an ape to protecting adorable little Christmas lights from getting chomped on by mutants. Which, by the way, is one of the most depressing parts of the entire game. Seeing their little faces as they march steadfastly toward their own oblivions. It's haunting. Also, you make camel spit into a tree's mouth. So there's that. You see this a lot in games from this time. You see, the media as a whole had been around just long enough to be taken seriously, but technology hadn't really plateaued yet, so you get this weird blend of creativity that a lot of modern games don't have in my opinion. The only other thing to really touch on in Mumbo's Mountain is Mumbo himself. He's a witch doctor who, in exchange for these Mumbo tokens that are found throughout the entire game, will transform you into things in different levels. These include anything from a termite so that you can climb up a termite's nest, to a walrus so that you can tread freezing water without taking damage. Because that's an ability that walruses have. It's, it's the blubber. It's, it's the blub, blubber. Right there, it's the blubber. There's also a small chance he'll screw up and turn you into a washing machine and then try to wash his loincloth in you. Not cool, bro. Not cool. From Mumbo's Mountain, we head to Treasure Trove Cove where we uncover a few new moves and a place to put cheat codes in. Ugh, feels like this level is hiding something more. Well, whatever. On to the third world, Clanker's Cavern. It was around this time that I started noticing what is, in my opinion, the most obvious flaw this game presents. The hub world, Gruntilda's Lair. There were several times, especially in the first half of the game, where I spent almost as much time in the lair trying to find my way around as I did in the actual levels themselves. In fact, I really didn't have a good grasp on the overall layout until the last third of the game. While there are cauldrons that you can use as teleporters spread in pretty easily reached places, it was still pretty frustrating to say the least. Let's be honest though, this was a pretty common problem in games before and after the Nintendo 64. They can't all be Peach's Castle after all. From a living garbage disposal in Clanker's Cavern to a cantankerous coral turtle in Bubblegoop Swamp. Yeah, ultimate play of the game obviously stepped their naming game up a little. From there to Freeze Easy Peak, where OH MY GOD, LISTEN TO THIS MAGIC! Okay, yeah, you knew it had to happen at some point. Every time this game is mentioned, something has to be said for the unbelievable music. There are plenty of good examples in the game I could've pulled from, but this is the one that especially stands out to me. That intro alone continues to get my blood pumped even as I'm writing this. Good stuff, Mr. Kirko. Good stuff. So yeah, snow to sand in Gobi's Valley, and then into a haunted land occupied by some pretty crass flower pots. Thank you. Rude! Moving on. Finally, at long last, we reach Rusty Bucket Bay. This level in particular is pretty well known as being the point in the game where most people drop the 100% goal. The level in its entirety isn't all that bad, really. Some annoying parts, for sure, but definitely not worth all the warnings I got before trying it. And then I came across the only part in this game where I really contemplated just skipping it and moving on to the next world. The hull of the ship in particular is a literal rage pot, stewing up something so foul it should not be mentioned. Smell that? <laughs> That's the smell of broken dreams soaked in the tears of the innocent. Smells a bit like old cheese. Unfortunate food poisoning aside, we eventually stick it out and complete what many had told me to be the worst part of the game. And really, they're right. The rest of the game is certainly harder than most of the previous levels, but Rusty Bucket definitely stands out as a level where the designers just made some plain old bad choices. It's cool, no one is perfect. At most you took like, maybe three years off my life? Other games have definitely done worse. The next world, Click Clock Wood, is in stark contrast to Rusty Bucket Bay. This is one they almost put too much thought into. The entire world is based around a gimmick of switching seasons. It's almost like having four separate worlds put into one with them affecting each other in certain ways. For instance, you plant a seed and water it in each different season, watching it grow and eventually die in winter actually gave me an odd existential feeling. Not something I think was done on purpose, but hey, it's cool that it happened. So we've collected every single Jinji, every music note, and we've rescued every Jinjo. How do we cap off this adventure? How do we go face our ultimate enemy? Glad you asked. Why through a board game, of course. Did I mention that this game can get kind of weird? Yeah, I know a lot of people didn't see this one coming when they first played the game. But hey, it's actually a pretty neat idea. You move forward one space at a time and face different challenges. 
This can be anything from a simple question about the game, to a time challenge, to randomized questions about Gruntilda herself. The answers to which can be found with her sister Brentilda, who has been hiding all throughout Gruntilda's lair. Hope you had a pencil and paper because you are most definitely going to need those answers. This part is actually pretty dang difficult. It doesn't help that there are these insta-death squares where if you fail the question you instantly get killed and have to start all over. Combine that with the ability to earn skip cards and you actually have a surprising level of depth and strategy for what seems to just be a random in-game gimmick. It's tough, no doubt, but definitely something that was unique at the time and really still is even 15 years later. So, you've beaten Gruntilda at her own game and rescued your sister. That's it, right? Game over. No, there's more. Gruntilda made you sit through a rather adorable credit scene so that she could escape. So now you must bring the fight to her once more. There are plenty of little bonuses here for you to get depending on how many notes you've collected, but the most important and useful is easily the honeycomb painting that effectively doubles your health bar. And hey, it's only four jiggies! It's a steal, not a deal. It's a steal, not a deal. And now, for real this time, the final battle. Not gonna lie, I died on this one a lot. And for the most part, they were pretty legitimate deaths. There was once or twice where I'd say it wasn't really my fault, but with the help of our Jinjo friends and absolutely no cheats, we finally take down the evil witch once and for all. And I do mean once and for all. Look at her. She got crushed. She's dead. We literally murdered her. Cold blood. So the day is saved and we once again get some very cute credits. <laughs> Boobs. So all together, I think this was a really good experience and something I'm very sad I missed out on as a kid. I mean, yeah, there are certainly parts that I got frustrated at, and some things that I think they could improve upon. But as a whole, this was a great experience. The difficulty slope especially was something that I really enjoyed. Maybe not a perfect slope, but definitely more challenging than most other 3D platformers of the time. And hey, I hear this game has some pretty awesome sequels out there. What the hell was that? Hey guys, I just want to take a second here at the end of the video to thank you so much for watching. I really, really do appreciate it. This was my first review video, uh, and I really, really want to know what you guys think about it. So please, please leave a comment, tell me what, if you thought it was good, if you thought it was bad, you know, whichever. And if you want to see more, please subscribe. I also have a Twatter and a Twambler and whatever other social media things off to the side there, so you can. You can click them. You can, you can just go right on there and click it. Click, click, click. Click it, click, clack, click, 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 click. Now, I see you guys later.